If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It be the times I be. tuning in to another episode. Uh, today what we're going to touch on is the topic of Easter. Uh, many of you have been socially conditioned into accepting this tradition of Easter at face value without understanding the origin, the background, where it comes from, and what the true meaning of this custom of Easter is. You're gonna, uh, Most people present it as it has something to do with commemorating the death and resurrection of Christ. But what you're going to find out in this video is that it has nothing to do with that at all and has everything to do with satanic worship and pagan rituals. Many people are going to be upset about the information that comes out in this video. Do I care? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The truth must come out whether you like it, love it, hate it or not. The truth doesn't change uh, no matter how mad you get. So that's what we're going to be dealing with in this video and to give those that want to know both sides of the story and want to know exactly what it is that they're commemorating and taking part of every year. People that want to wake that are waking up and asking questions on the traditions that they're following to see if it matches up with the scriptures and what God wants us to do or if it's taking us towards another path. That's what we're going to deal with today. I'm Brother Yerashua. This is the Bible Unlocked, the Easter Deception. Revelations 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, 
which deceiveth the whole world. So this is the verse you need to keep in mind as we go on to this lesson. That the prophecy in the Bible says that Satan would deceive the whole world. And what you're going to find out is that the festival of Easter is one of the many tactics that Satan used to be deceptive throughout the entire world. See, the Christian church is still looking for this deception to happen sometime in the future. They're still waiting for this great massive deception to happen when they don't even understand that this deception has already happened. The deception start with you thinking that you're already not deceived. That's where the deception happens. There's layers to the deception. And this Easter celebration is one of these many deceptive tools that Satan has used to get people to go away from the Bible and to follow him instead of uh, Christ or what the Most High says. The Two Babylons, page 93. The festival of which we read in church history under the name of Easter in the third or fourth centuries was quite a different festival from that now observed in the Romish church. The festival that you celebrate known as Easter during the time of Christ was not celebrated the same exact way that they do today. It had nothing to do with bunnies laying eggs and Easter rabbits. The celebration was known as the Passover, something totally different, and it's going to explain in here, and it was never called Easter. Follow me. And at that time was not known by any such name as Easter. It was called Pash or the Passover. It was called what God told it to be called back in Exodus, the Passover, not Easter. You're going to find out that Easter is dealing with a totally different custom and uh, God. That's what you're going to come to realize, that that has nothing to do with the Bible at all. And though not of apostolic institution, was very early observed by many professing Christians in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Christ. And the Passover, in the correct context, was celebrated during the time of Christ by many of the Christians that followed the teaching of Christ. Not bunnies laying eggs, or Easter rabbits, or dying eggs, or any of that, anything of that nature. It was the Passover. Socrates, the ancient ecclesiastical historian, after a lengthened account of the different ways in which Easter was observed in different countries in his time, i.e. the 5th century, sums up in these words. Socrates, who was a 5th century Christian church historian, went around and did his research and found out that this custom of Easter is being celebrated all throughout the world. Let's find out what else he found. Thus much already laid down may seem a sufficient treatise to prove that the celebration of the Feast of Easter began everywhere more of custom than by any commandment either of Christ or any apostle. Socrates, the Christian historian, found out that this Easter celebration has nothing to do with Christ or God or the Bible. Christ never gave a commandment for you to go out there and worship on an Easter. The apostles never gave a commandment for people to go out there and do Easter egg hunts. The Bible never said anything about doing this festival called Easter. He says this is something, this is, this is a custom that was created by other people. Now I'm going to believe Socrates' uh, 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 account versus the Christian pastor's account. Because Socrates was there during the time when the Roman Catholic Church amalgamated these uh, uh, pagan principles and practices into the Christian church. He was there around that time. So I'm going to take his account versus someone that came 2,000 years later, which has a, a different agenda. He went and did the research on the various places that were celebrating this custom known as Easter. Page 96. Such is the history of Easter. The popular observances that still attend the period of its celebration amply confirm the testimony of history as to its Babylonian character. The custom of Easter throughout all research uh, it brings a paper trail all the way back to the Babylonians, the ancient Babylonians. That's where this custom uh, derived from. The hot cross buns of Good Friday and the dyed eggs of Pash or Easter Sunday figured in the Chaldean rites 
just as they do now. Yes, the dyed eggs and the hot cross buns all stem back to the Chaldeans, which are the ancient Babylonians. That custom goes all the way back to ancient Babylon. There's nothing new under the sun. The ritual was picked up and it made its way all the way down to the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire, when they came and took over the Americas, they implemented it in with the rest of the pagan customs in Christianity. They didn't just wake up. I mean, the, the eggs just didn't pop up out of nowhere. They didn't say, they, they, I mean, they didn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, we know this Easter has to do with the, the, the resurrection and death of Christ, but you know what, we're just going to add some eggs in there. I like the way they look. I'm just going to go ahead and add a few eggs in there. No, it has an origin. It has a history. They're just not going to tell you what it is because you're going to find out that you're worshiping Satan. They're not going to tell you what it is. And and most of you probably don't care, too lazy to do your own research. And guess what? Satan and the hierarchy, they like people like you. You're the ones they want in their society. The ones that's going to just go with the flow and eat up everything that they feed to you. They love people like you. That's a slave mentality. The buns known too by that identical name were used in the worship of the queen of heaven, the goddess Easter, as early as the days of sea crops, the founder of Athens, that is 1,500 years before the Christian era. 1,500 years prior to when Christ stepped foot on the scene, they was already celebrating Easter bunny laying eggs. Let me say it again. 1,500 years prior to Christ stepping foot on the scene, they were already celebrating Easter bunnies laying eggs. They was already dying eggs. They were already dealing with Easter bunnies. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. When we were still in captivity in the land of Egypt, they were already celebrating the Queen Mother of Heaven, which is what this is dealing with. The Queen Mother of Heaven, beginning with Semiramis in ancient Babylon. They were already dealing with this custom. So when Christ was on the scene, People were already doing their Easter, bu Easter bunny uh, egg hunts when Christ was walking on the scene. They were probably some of the people that he was healing. People that fell off into that custom. So this Easter bunny egg concept has nothing to do with Christ, his death or his resurrection at all. It's all a play on your emotions to have you believe that you're doing something that's comm commemorating Christ. But really, what you're doing is worshiping the Queen Mother of Heaven. And we're going to get more information about this Queen Mother of Heaven, Queen Mother of Heaven, so you know exactly who it is you're paying homage to. And this custom was being done during the time of Jeremiah. This is nothing new. Jeremiah was dealing with the same people as today, dealing with this Queen Mother of Heaven worship. He was dealing with that during that time. Let's get the account out of the Bible with Easter going on during the time of Jeremiah, the Babylonian captivity. Let's find out. Jeremiah 7, verse 18. The children gather wood. The children go to the store to go ahead and get the coals. This is what they do today. It's going to be the same exact thing they were doing during the time of Jeremiah. The children get sent out to go ahead and go to the store with a few dollars to go pick up the coal. Go ahead and pick that up. And the fathers kindle the fire. And the father is outside with his chef cape on, getting ready to kindle the fire for the barbecue. That's what, he, that's what he's outside doing. That's what the father's outside doing. And for when the kids bring the coal, he's getting the barbecue ready, getting the grill ready. And the women need their dough. And the women are inside in the kitchen needing the dough, getting the rest of the entree ready. <coughs> that's what the women are doing. But let's find out what they're doing all this for to make cakes to the queen of heaven, to eat dinner on Easter Sunday to the queen of heaven. Same exact thing, to bake cakes to the queen of heaven. That's what they were doing back then, and that's what they're doing today. You get your whole feast ready for your Easter Sunday to bake cakes to the queen of heaven. Let's get more and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. That you are provoking the most high to anger when you're sending up these hot cross buns to other gods, to the queen mother of heaven. 
pouring out your drink offerings to the Queen Mother of Heaven on your Easter Sunday. Because that's what you're essentially dealing with. The Queen Mother of Heaven, not the Most High. When you're sitting there on your Easter Sunday dinner, thinking that you're sitting, sit, sending this, the, the savor up into the skies for the Most High to smell, he's not accepting that. Because he knows that's going to the Queen Mother of Heaven. Which we're going to find out who exactly this Queen Mother of Heaven is. The hot cross buns are not now offered, but eaten. On the festival of Astarte, the festival of Astarte, which is another name for Easter. That's where you're sending your cross, your hot cross buns up, and all the rest of the meal that you prepare. Not to the Most High, you're sending it up to Astarte. Let's find out who this Astarte is, so we can be clear on what you're doing on this Easter Sunday when you're gathering all your kids together, cousins, nephews, uncles, aunties, little babies, all of old grandma. Let's find out exactly what you're doing and who you're sending this up to. That's what we're going to get ready to find out. Zonovan Bible Dictionary. Ashtaroth. Astarte. Ashtaroth is plural of Ashtoreth. Name of any of the fertility goddess of the ancient Near East. Babylonian. Astar. The Babylonians called the Queen Mother of Heaven, which is what you're worshiping on Easter Sunday. The Babylonians called her Astar. Greek Astarte, the Greeks called the same exact Queen Mother of Heaven that you're worshiping on Easter Sunday. They called her Astarte, which is the same exact God or same exact goddess as the Babylonians. In Canaan, a consort of El, Baal. And in Canaan, this Astarte or Estar is the consort of El or Baal which means that she is the consort, which means she is the wife of Baal. So the queen mother of heaven is the wife of Baal. Now we need to find out who is this Baal? Let's get a little bit more detail. Who is this Baal? Is this that she's the wife of? Or she's the wife to? Who is this the wife to? So you can find out what you're dealing with on this Easter Sunday. Baal Zebub. Baal, or Lord of Flies. Name under which Baal was worshipped by the Philistines of Ekron. There can be little doubt that Beelzebub is the same name as Baalzebub. So Baal, which is what the name was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament you're going to see uh, Beelzebub. You'll see Baalzebub and Baal in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament they call them Beelzebub. So we need to find out exactly who this Beelzebub is according to the Bible to see what demon you're dealing with on Easter Sunday. Follow me. Matthew 12, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Beelzebub is the prince of the devils. The husband to a star or Astarte, the Queen Mother of Heaven, the same woman that you're worshiping on Easter Sunday. She is the wife of Satan, the head demon. He's the leading demon out of the demon, the demon, the demonic forces. She is the wife of Satan himself. This is who you're pouring out hot, uh, pouring out your drinks and your and your hot cross buns are being offered to the Queen Mother of Heaven, the, sa the, the wife of Satan. This is what you're dealing with when you have your kids in there on your Easter Sunday dinner, all getting together in one big family in unison, getting ready to send up the whole meal, thinking you're sending it up to the Most High when you're sending it straight up to Satan's wife. The hot cross buns are not now offered, but eaten on the festival of Astarte. But this leaves no doubt as to whence they have been derived. The origin of the posh egg is just as clear. Now we're going to get into the origin of these Easter eggs. Because like I said, a lot of you think they just popped up out of nowhere. No, there's an origin to everything. There's a method to all the madness. And he says that it's just as clear. Meaning you can trace the customs back to where they come from. All you have to do is go through different civilizations and find out what they're doing. You can say, okay, now we see where this custom comes from. The ancient Druids born egg 
as the sacred emblem of their order. Ancient Druids, which were the inhabitants of Europe in the land of Britain and Gaul and in Ireland, they were the ones, they were also dealing with this Easter egg. Let's find out who else was dealing with it. In the Dionysiaca or Mysteries of Bacchus, as celebrated in Athens, one part of the nocturnal ceremony consisted in the consecration of an egg. The ancient Greeks were dealing with the consecration of an egg. They were dealing with the bunny rabbits laying eggs. And it had nothing to do with Christ. Trust me. Nothing to do with Christ, his death and his resurrection. Because this is way before Christ. Let's get some more. The Hindu fables celebrate their mundane egg as of golden color. The Hindus were dealing with the bunny rabbit land eggs. But the Hindus wanted to spice it up a little bit. So theirs was not just a regular egg, it was a golden egg. Let's find out who else was dealing with the egg. The people of Japan make their sacred egg to have been brazen. And Japan was dealing with an egg. We didn't went all the way to Japan to find people dealing with eggs in pagan rituals. Let's get some more. In China, at this hour, dyed or painted eggs are used on the sacred festivals. Even as in this country, China was even getting it in with the eggs. China, if you know anything about China, China is one of the most atheist countries in the world. They were dealing with an egg. They don't believe anything in, about Christ. A, major, a good, great deal of the people in that country. Pagans, atheists, they were dealing with an egg. Just like Socrates says, when he ran around and did his research, he found out that this custom is in a, in, a, in a variety of different places. And it had nothing to do with a commandment from Christ or the apostles. In ancient times, eggs were used in the religious rites of the Egyptians and the Greeks and were hung up for mystic purposes in their temples. From Egypt, these sacred eggs can be distinctly traced to the banks of the Euphrates. The banks of the Euphrates is going right back to ancient Babylon, where it all started, under Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. The same customs were taken from the Tower of Babel when the Most High split the tongues and he spread out the rest of the nations. They took their customs with them and they all went, that's why they're all similar. And the egg was definitely part of the Babylonian custom, which spilled over into Egypt, and then into Greece, and then into Rome, and then from Rome all the way over here to America. Same exact custom, just different faces and different characters used to cover it up. The classic poets are full of the fable of the mystic egg of the Babylonians, and thus its tale is told by Hygienius the Egyptian the learned keeper of the Palatine Library at Rome. Now we're getting ready to find out where exactly did this legend of this egg come from? What is the origin of the story of this egg? So we can find out what you're dealing with on Easter Sunday when you got your kids out there doing Easter egg hunts. In the time of Augustus, who was skilled in all the wisdom of the native country, an egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from heaven into the river Euphrates. So the legend is that an egg of wondrous size, some massive egg, all of a sudden came down out of heaven and fell into the river Euphrates. This is where the egg come from. Let's get some more. The fishes rolled it into the bank where the dove having settled upon it and hatched it. The fishes rolled it out of the water and put it on the bank where the dove came, sat on it, and hatched it. Now let's find out what happened when the dove hatched it. Who managed to pop up out of this egg? Out came Venus. Out came the devil's wife. That's who Venus is, Astarte, same exact goddess. Out came the devil's wife, who afterward was called the Syrian goddess, that is Astarte. Hence the egg became one of the symbols of Astarte or Easter. This is where you get your Easter bunny laying eggs at. It became a symbol of Easter, or Astarte, worshiping the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife. This is where it derives from. This is the legend behind it. This is what you have your kids dabbling with on your Easter Sunday when you're sending up 
hot cakes to the queen mother of heaven. This is what you're dealing with. Yes, Satan gave his wife a holiday as well. Let me say it again. Satan gave his wife a holiday as well, which he got the whole world worshiping. And thinking that it has something to do with Christ, the resurrection and death of Christ, which most people, they know that it just don't have anything to do with Christ's death and resurrection. But too scared to ask a question about what does this Easter egg hunt, what does this Easter egg hunt have to do with Christ dying on the cross and being risen again on the third day? Too scared to be to go contrary to what the world does. Too timid to ask questions. Got your kids over there doing Easter egg hunts to the devil's wife and cooking a hot Sunday dinner to send it up to Astarte, the devil's wife. This is how Satan deceived the whole world. And accordingly, in Cyprus, one of the chosen seats of the worship of Venus, or Astarte, the egg of wondrous size was represented on grand scale, on a grand scale, all the way back then, 2000 or 1500 years prior to Christ, and all the way 2000 years after Christ. On a grand scale, got your kids in churches on Easter Sunday, sending hot cakes up to the Queen Mother of Heaven. Yes, I said it. Hot cakes. I'm going to keep saying it. Got your whole Hawaiian rolls, lemon meringue pies. Got them all getting ready to get sent up to the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife. Satan's consort. Baal's above. That's what you're dealing with on your Easter Sunday. That has nothing to do with Christ, it's his resurrection or death. It's on a grand scale. And it's a tradition that most people do not want to let go because to them it feels good inside. They feel like they're doing something right for the kids. Well, guess what? That's what Satan wants you to believe. Satan deals with emotions. The Most High is not dealing with emotions. He's dealing with laws and commandments, what he told you to do and what he told you not to do. You, you want to deal with uh, emotions? Satan is right there for you caressing every single emotion and, 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 and having you rationalize in your mind that it's okay to do Easter even though you know it don't have anything to do with Christ and his resurrection. The Two Babylons, page 97. Now the Romish church adopted this mystic egg of Astarte and consecrated it as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. Guess who's in charge of your Easter bunny laying eggs? Yes, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman pagan church, who has always been pagan from the foundation. Anything that has to do with Roman doctrine has always has to be looked at with skepticism. They're the ones who took this concept and of the egg and say, you know what? We're going to make this egg, which we know is going towards the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife. We're going to trick the people and make them believe that this egg has something to do with Christ's death and resurrection. Absolutely. Because during during that time, Christianity, the doctrine of Christ, was on an uprise. The Romans had to find something. The Romans couldn't control it. So if you can't beat something, what do you do? You join it. And they did a great job in joining it. They did more than join it. They joined it, then took it over and cooked and, and kicked the, uh, the true Christian doctrine out. That's what the Romans did. They wiggled their way inside the Christian doctrine when the Gentiles were able to get grafted in. This is how they repaid the Most High. By taking out his feast days and replacing it with Satan's feast days. Easter being one of them. The first seven ecumenical councils, page 68. In the second declaration, the bishops ruled that Easter should be celebrated at the same time throughout the empire. This is during the Council of Nicaea. It wasn't some political party that came and said, you know what, we're going to institute Easter. It was the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops, who said, we're going to make this part of the, uh, the, the Christian doctrine. We're going to take this pagan holiday because we know that the, the, the Roman citizens don't want to let it go. So we're going to take this and we're going to add it to the Christian doctrine so you can get the best of both worlds. You can worship Satan. The pagans can worship Satan, and we can act like we're worshiping the Most High at the same time. But we really want to worship Satan because 
his uh, uh, holidays feel a little bit better. You can be a little bit more liberal on his holidays. We don't really want to deal with Satan's uh, or the Most High's holidays. And you have to understand with the Roman Catholic Church, they, they were always pagans. And through their pagan gods, when they went out to fight wars, they would always make sacrifices to the pagan gods. So they believed heavily in these pagan gods because that's how they were winning all these wars when they went and stomped all the people, going through different countries, stomping out all the people. Then they attributed that to all those pagan gods that they were worshiping. So they did not want to give those gods up. But like I said, when the Christianity was on an uprise, they, didn't, they, they had to find some way to suppress it. So they just uh, blended them both together so they can still worship their same gods, Satan, and make people think that the other people are really worshiping the Most High God. Acts 16, verse 20. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. This is Paul being brought by the masters of some lady that he just healed because she had a, a spirit of divination on her. Her masters didn't like that he healed her. So they brought him to the magistrates because the Romans, like I said, have always been pagans and they never wanted anything to do with the Most High God. They brought him to the magistrates and said, this man is troubling our city. You would think it would be a good thing for Paul to be casting out demons. But no, not to the Romans. They say, he said that this, these men are troubling our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Roman. Trying to tell us to keep God's commandments and worship the Most High, and we don't want to do that. We want to worship Satan. They, did see how the Romans had a problem with that? They said it's unlawful that means it's a law for us not to be able to keep God's commandments. That's what it was with the Romans. To be a pagan is what you needed to do. So th th this guy, these people were complaining that Paul was over there healing people and telling people to keep God's commandments and follow Christ. Anytime you're dealing with the Roman Catholic Church, always you always have to be skeptic. You always have to use skepticism when dealing with doctrines from the Roman Catholic Church. Who else is dealing with the Roman Catholic Church? 99% of the Christian churches all around the world. If you're dealing with Sunday worship, you're part of the Roman Catholic Church. If you're dealing with Christmas, you're part of the Roman Catholic Church. If you're dealing with Easter, you're part of the Roman Catholic Church. If you're dealing with any pagan religion, if you're dealing with the laws, the, the laws are done away with, you're dealing with the Roman Catholic Church. You're part of the Roman Catholic Church. You're an offspring of the Roman Catholic Church. No matter how many ways you want to slice it and dice it, those doctrines come from the Roman Catholic Church. They come from the Roman Catholic Church. If you believe in a virgin birth that Christ didn't have a mother and a father, you're part of the Roman Catholic Church. Always use skepticism when dealing with those doctrines. And do further research. And get out of a slave mentality. Now, some of you may be confused because when you read the Bible, you're going to run across one passage that says the word Easter. This is the only passage in the entire Bible that says the word Easter. So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you exactly how they injected the word Easter to make you believe that that is what they were practicing during the time of Christ. And the apostles and, and, and all the other disciples were dealing with Easter as you know it today. Follow me. Acts chapter 12, verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. At this time is the feast of unleavened bread, which is part of the Passover. Keep this in mind. This is the feast of unleavened bread that's going on. And watch how they're going to smoothly inject the word Easter into the scriptures to make you think that Easter and the uh, feast of unleavened bread are synonymous but we're going to go deeper into the scriptures and into the translation to find out what word is really there and when he had apprehended him he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after easter to bring him forth to the people now you see that they put the word easter in there 
they injected the word Easter in there. So when someone reads it, they're going to believe, okay, you know what? I guess I am supposed to be doing Easter bunny egg hunts and chocolate covered eggs. Or I guess I am supposed to be doing that because they were doing it in the Bible. Right. That's to someone who does not do any research. That's the point of them slipping it in there because they know that a slave is not going to do any further research. You're going to take everything at face value and you're not going to double check anyone's work. They put this in here purposely to give someone a reason to justify worshiping the queen mother of heaven, Satan's wife, and give you a reason to do it. Now, let's go to the Greek, which it was written in, and find out what does the Greek word say? Let's find out if it's talking about Easter bunnies laying eggs or if it's talking about the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's find out. Strong's G3957. Pascha. The Paschal Feast. The Feast of the Passover. No, bunnies laying eggs. The Passover. No, worshiping the Queen Mother of Heaven. The Passover. The Feast of the Passover, ladies and gentlemen. The Passover. This Greek word has nothing to do with Easter Sunday. Satan deceived the whole world. Yes, Satan has his hands in all types of different venues. You must be doing your own research to find out what words are here, what words are there. You cannot trust anyone when it's dealing with your soul salvation. Especially not a pastor that's set up by the Roman Catholic Church who's just going to regurgitate things over and over again and not tell you that, you know what, what we're doing is wrong on Easter Sunday. We're not supposed to be sending up cakes to the Queen Mother of Heaven. We're not supposed to be doing that. When you're dealing with your soul salvation, you have to seek it out. Now, this Greek word was used 29 times in the New Testament. Each time it was used, it always said the word passed over. Always said the word pass over. Like I said, Satan only needed to inject it in there one time to get your mind away from uh, what's going on. To allow your mind to justify worshiping him. Because he can care less if you worship him unaware or if you worship him worshiping him on purpose. He can care less. As long as he can get you out of doing what God says, he's, he, he's in the right mode. Now let's find out what the scholars say about this translation on this Easter here. The Two Babylons, page 93. Everyone knows that the name Easter, used in our translation of Acts 12, verse 4, refers not to any Christian festival, but to the Jewish Passover. Everyone knows that this word Easter is not supposed to be there. Everyone knows that Satan done injected the word Easter into the Bible. And when he says everyone, he's not talking about the peasants going to, to church on Sunday, the, the Sunday worshipers that's going in there, not opening up the Bible, sitting there in a Sunday church, listening to someone speak, uh, preach, which ain't coming from the Bible, for two hours, getting up, singing songs and dancing, paying tithes and going home. He's not talking about you. When he says everyone, is referring to everyone in the hierarchy that has their hands in the Christian doctrine. The high-ranking bishops that are controlling the, the Christian doctrine going around. The, the, the Bible scholars, they all know that this translation is incorrect. They all know that this translation is incorrect. The translators, when they, when, when they translate the Bible, they know that that, that translation, translation doesn't go there. But they're under someone else's authority, and they are forced to put that translation there as Easter, when they know it does not say Easter there. And we're going to prove that that they know it as well. Everyone knows that, that that translation does not go there. This is one of the few places in our version where the translators show an undue bias. This is one of the few places in the Bible showing that Satan has his hand in the translations. That's what he's saying. This is one of the few places where you can see clearly Satan's signature on it. Because it's a clear purposely done mistranslation it's not like it was something difficult or, 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 or some difficult translation some difficult Greek word it was a clear mistranslation on purpose and when he says everyone we're getting ready to prove that everyone knows this all your all your Bible scholars 
all the top uh, bishops, the Roman Catholic Church, they all know that that word Easter does not go there. But remember, Satan is controlling the whole thing. Satan controls the world. He's in control of this world. Satan is at the helm of the Roman Catholic Church. Zondervan Bible Dictionary. Easter. Passover. Rendered Easter in Acts 12 verse 4, KJV. But correctly translated Passover in ASV. Correctly translated Passover. This is from the Bible scholars. Correctly translated Passover in the ASV. Knowing and showing that the scholars know that that does not go there. But they're going to continue putting that word Easter there because of the powers that be. In order to maintain power in this current world, you have to be dealing with Satan. Because Satan is the prince of this world. As soon as you start trying to go to righteousness, referring to the hierarchy, Satan is going to move you out of the way and he's going to lift someone else up who's going to do his job. So in order to maintain the high status, they have to continue pushing Satan's agenda in order to keep uh, global power. That's what this is going into. Now, let's deal with the main premise that the Roman Christian church uses to justify their Easter Sunday worship. It relies off of the premise that Christ rose on a Sunday. Hence, Easter Sunday. Now we can comm commemorate the resurrection of Christ because it happened on the first day of the week and now we're justified for doing it. Now let's find out if that's true according to the scriptures because it sounds good from the surface when you hear somebody talk without backing it up. Let's go into the scriptures and find out did Christ rise on a Sunday or is that another tactic used by the devil to, this, to deceive the whole world? And you be the judge. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to die, pay attention to what you're reading. Shake off the religion and pay attention to what you're reading. It says, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Meaning it was not the first day of the week. It was dawning toward the first day of the week. Meaning the sun was getting ready to drop, but it was still the Sabbath day. Understand this. I, I need to speak. To, I need to speak like this because when it doesn't matter, people with high educations can't understand this basic concept that's getting ready to be brought out. Because that religion, when it grabs you, it's got a hold on you, like worse than any drug. Dawning toward the first day of the week, that means it was still the Sabbath day. Let's find out what happened when Mary Magdalene came to the sepulchre of Christ. Verse five. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Christ was not there. He was already risen. It was dawning toward the first day of the week, meaning it was still the Sabbath day. Christ was already up and walking around when they came to visit the sepulcher on the Sabbath day. It was not a first day. It was still the Sabbath day. When they came, he was already gone. He was already risen. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to find a house, an intelligent and intellectual person can sit here and read this and come out with the conclusion of Sunday. It's not because of that. It's because of religion. Religion and psychology. Psychology make your mind believe anything and anything it wants. And you're going to find out how powerful psychology is when we get ready to go into this next part of the topic. Psychology is on another level. That's what Satan's dealing with, psychology. To make you believe that this is talking about the first day of the week to try and justify Sunday uh, worship and Easter worship and, uh, and Easter Sunday. When it's clear that Christ was not in the tomb when they came when it was dawning toward the first day of the week. He was gone already. Understand that. That's your Easter Sunday already gone. Telling you that the premise is a lie. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has everything to do with worshiping the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife. It has everything to do with uh, 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 cooking hot buns to the Queen Mother of Heaven. 
as they were doing it 1500 years prior to Christ. Before he was even on the, uh, uh, walking the earth, they were already doing this. But now the Roman Catholic Church amalgamated this practice in and trying to find every little scripture they can to try to make it to try to justify the pagan worship and make all the masses believe it. And you will believe it if you're a slave. A slave, a slave mind will believe it. You'll believe anything that's tossed in front of you, like something as simple as this. The, the, the pastors make sure they leave no room for questioning at the end of the sermon. And when you do ask them a question, they're not going to bring you to the Bible. They're going to give you a bunch of philosophy on how we're supposed to be doing Easter. Sending your soul right to the lake of fire. That's what's going on. You need to touch on the Good Friday deception. Because the Good Friday goes off of the premise that Christ died on a Friday and he rose on a Sunday. But when you go to the scriptures, you're going to find out there's a problem with that. Watch Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth says he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm still trying to figure out what mathematical equation the Christian church has came up with in order to get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. I'm trying to figure out what type of dimension they're delving into to make this add up. I've counted this thing multiple times and I can't figure out how you get three days and three nights and have a whole billions of people believe that this math adds up. Let's count and see if we can get it because maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I haven't del delved into that fourth or fifth dimension that these other people are delving in to, to see this. Friday night to Saturday night is one day. Saturday night to Sunday night is two days. Christ said he would be in the belly of the earth for three days. That means it would be from Sunday night to Monday night would be three days. Which we know is still a lie because Christ rose on a Sabbath. When they came to the sepulchre, he was already gone when it was dawning toward the first day. So the whole premise is wrong. The whole premise is built off of deceit. Christ, you can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. It's impossible. Einstein can't do it. I don't care what, what mathematician you bring out, he can't do it. This is basic mathematics that you learn in the first grade or in kindergarten. Now let's do the math correctly to find out when he died. We know he rose on a Sabbath day for sure. So we go Wednesday to Thursday. That's one day. Thursday to Friday, that's two days. Friday to Saturday. Amazing how the math adds right up. Christ didn't die on a Friday, ladies and gentlemen. He died on a Wednesday. Friday, you can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. Both of those are wrong. The Friday and the Sunday, they're both wrong. And the Christian church is purposely misleading the people. Purposely misleading the people off of simple mathematics that any first grader could put together and got people with PhDs not, not able to understand this, not asking questions. When you got a little first grader who can figure this out. This is the deception going on in the Christian church. Satan is all in it. He's all the way in it. Now, let's find out what holiday or holy day you're supposed to be celebrating at the same exact time that you're sending up cakes to the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife. God gives you a holiday or a holy day to be celebrated during the same exact time of the year. So there's no excuse on why you can't do the Most High's holiday and you have to go and do Satan's holiday. There's no excuse. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. 
And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eatings shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And this is going deep right here because Christ was the Passover lamb and he was without blemish. All this is going in. This is all leading up to Christ. But most people don't even understand it. This is a whole lesson in itself. So I'm not going to go too deep in it. But Christ was the lamb without blemish. He was the, the sacrifice, the Passover lamb that was sacrificed. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And this is exactly what they did to Christ. The congregation got together and said, put him to death. This is the same exact account right here. And you're not celebrating this. This is what you're supposed to be celebrating. This is what you're supposed to be commemorating. This is supposed to be the memorial. Not Easter bunnies laying eggs. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So you're supposed to eat the Passover lamb with bitter herbs. That's what you're supposed to also get, the lamb and the bitter herbs. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain unto the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And you're supposed to eat the entire lamb dinner and have nothing left for the morning. It's supposed to be all eaten that same day. So it's not no, give me a plate, let me send one home, or let me give out three or four plates to take home. It's not none of that. You eat the dinner that night, anything else, it's, it's done. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Most High's Passover. You eat it with haste because we had to leave Egypt quick. So you eat the dinner quick. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This is the part of, uh, uh, this part represents Christ's blood. For the next destruction that's getting ready to come up. The next plagues that are getting ready to come up. That's why when it says in the New Testament, Christ is our Passover. That means he's, his blood is our Passover. So when the, the Most High gets ready to put his last destruction out, if you don't have that blood of Christ, and I'm, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Christ. I'm not talking about that Jesus. I'm talking about the Christ of the Bible. If you don't have that blood sprinkled on you, get ready to die. If you get caught and on Easter Sunday, sending up cakes to the Queen Mother of Heaven, Get ready to die on that one. That's what the blood is commemorating. So when it says Christ is our Passover, that didn't say, that don't mean we don't have to do no Passover now because Christ became the Passover. No, his blood is the Passover. So when the Most High sends the death angels out and he sees the blood on you, they can pass right on over you and kill everyone else. That's worshiping the Queen Mother of Heaven on Easter Sunday. Yes. And Christmas and any other the pagan uh, rituals and this day shall be unto you for a memorial and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever what do you not understand about forever is my question we wouldn't have this discussion if people went into the Old Testament found out what the Most High said this discussion wouldn't even be on the table. The Most High said forever, forever. That means a thousand years past, you got another million years left. 
After that million years is left, you still got another hundred million years left. Forever. It didn't say until Christ came and died on the cross. It didn't say until Paul uh, went out preaching the word. It didn't say until the Roman Catholic Church took over the Christian doctrine and uh, uh, forced Easter upon you. It said forever. There should be no dispute on what you're supposed to be doing during the time. Because the Most High gives you two choices. He gave you Easter, that's a choice, or the Most High's Passover, when he tells you right now that it's supposed to be celebrated forever. Which one are you going to pick, is the question. I can't pick it for you, the Most High is not going to pick it for you. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. On the first day, you're supposed to take leaven out of your houses. Leaven is yeast. Anything with a, that's a rising agent is supposed to be taken out of your house. And you're supposed to eat unleavened bread, things like crackers, things that don't have any rising elements in it. You eat that. I mean, you can eat other things, but you can't have anything with yeast and rising agents in it. Of course, you can eat your regular meals, uh, your chicken, your, your beef. You can eat whatever else you want, but nothing with a rising agent in it during the seven days of unleavened bread. This is the most high speed. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And if Christ return and it's a Passover and he catch you slapping your lips on leavened bread, you're going to die. Let me say it again. If the Passover happens and Christ returns during the time of the Passover and he catch you slapping your lips on leavened bread, you're going to die. This judgment will come to pass. Absolutely. Because you won't be covered with the blood anyway. You're going to be off doing your own thing. Worshiping the goddess of star, the queen mother of heaven. You're going to be doing that. Worshiping and doing Christmas. That's what you're going to be doing. So you're not going to have the blood on you anyway. And in the first day, there shall be an holy convocation. And the first day of the most high feast, not Satan's feast, the most high feast is a holy convocation. You know the same exact thing you do on your Easter Sunday when you get together with all the church to send up hot buns to the Queen Mother of Heaven? Yes, for the Most High's Feast is a holy convocation. You get together with your family, get together with the congregation, you get together the same exact thing that you're doing for Satan, just you do it for the, for the Most High. That's the difference. And in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. And guess what? You get another convocation on the seventh day. So you get two co holy convocations to get together with everyone. Two is better than, better than one, right? So why would you want to take Satan's one when you can have the most highs two? No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. So the first day and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're not supposed to be doing any work. If, you can, if you're able to take those days off of work, take them off. You're not supposed to be outside doing anything else. No, no servile work. It's a day of rest. That only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. How many times did the Most High have to tell you forever? He knows that people are just not going to understand it. So he has to tell you forever, two times in the same sentence or in the same chapter. Forever. Forever means forever. That does not mean there's a time period when it stops. Forever means forever. Grasp that concept. Next time you get ready to go out and do your Easter Sunday. Grasp that concept. You can't stand in front of the Most High on Judgment Day when he has a verse like this in the Bible. There's nothing to be confused about. He said forever. It tells you in the Bible it's impossible for God to lie. That's what it tells you. That's the one thing that is impossible for him to do is to lie. He says forever. That's what he meant. Forever. Try to stand in front of him on judgment day and give him some excuse when you have this verse right here in the Bible saying forever. In the first month of the 14th day of the month at even ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. This confused with the first month in the modern calendar, because that's not what this is talking about. It's talking about the first month, which usually falls between March and April during the time of the new moon. 
The months in the Bible are, are, are go off of the new moons. Each time a new moon comes in is a new month. So that's what this is referring to. Usually during the time of March and April, there's the new moon that falls around that time. So the first or the 14th day of the new, after the new moon is when the Passover starts. And unleavened bread is going to be on your menu all the way to the 21st day at evening. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall not eat nothing leavened. In your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. This is the year 2015, and this year the Passover falls on a Friday, April the 3rd, at evening. Let me say it again. 2015, the Passover commences on April 3rd at evening of 2015. By coincidence, guess what else starts on April 3rd? Yep, you guessed it. Good Friday. Good Friday. So now you have to make a choice. Which one are you going to do? Are you going to do the Passover, like the Most High said, would be an ordinance and a memorial forever? Or are you going to do what the Roman Catholic Church tells you to do? Worship the Queen Mother of Heaven, Satan's wife, on April the 3rd. That's, an, that's, that's something you're going to have to pick. That's why the Most High always gives you two choices. He wants to see where your heart is really at. He want to see if you're going to be down with him or if you're going to be an idolater and go and worship other gods. That's what he wants to know. Easter Sunday falls on April 5th, two days later. Not three days like the Christian church will want to make you believe. Two days later is when your Easter Sunday is going on. But guess what else is going on during that time? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, like the Most High said. Seven days from the Passover starting April 3rd at evening, ending at April 11th at evening. But Satan worked his way right in there to have people think that they're supposed to be doing Easter at that time. But you're going to have to pick. Which one are you going to be doing? Because you can't do both. You can't bake cakes during the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because that's, that's unlawful during that time. No leavened bread. So there's going to be people doing, baking all type of cakes to the Queen Mother of Heaven with all type of leaven in there like the Most High told you not to do. This is where it comes down to what where your heart is really at. The Most High is always going to give you two choices. He'll give you two choices, absolutely. He'll give you your opportunity. If you want to worship Satan, you go right ahead. But there's a punishment for being an idolater. There's a punishment for doing what you think is right instead of what the most high told you is right revelations 21 verse 8 but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters people that's worshiping on easter sunday sending cakes and uh, prayers up to the queen mother of heaven on easter sunday all idolaters christmas worshipers all idolaters, man, they all in this list. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Which is the second death. This is where life-changing decisions are made. When truth comes out, this is how you find out what someone's really about. If they truly believe in the Bible, which most people don't, or if they just covering it up to... To, to use as a cover-up for the, 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 the other gods that they really want to worship. This is where you find out right here. And you're going to find out most people are not down with the Most High God in the Bible. That's why it tells you a remnant shall be saved. Most people don't understand what a remnant means. They don't understand that. They're going to get caught as a thief in the night. Whoever's not on guard, taking things at face value, and not doing your backup research. You, you got to understand that this is your soul salvation. Da, 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 this, you're going to be, you're going to, you're only here on earth for seven, eight years. If you're lucky. After that, you got to, you got to deal with it. 
Don't you give up now Cause you can't make it Hold up, hold up It's gonna get hard but you can't make it Stay firm, stay firm It's gonna get rough but you can't make it have faith, have faith, it's gonna get weary, but you can make it, be strong, be strong, pain's gonna come, but you can take it, I'm saying, hold on, hold on, it's gonna get hard, but you can make it. I said, stay firm, stay firm. It's gonna get hard, but you can make it. Have faith, got to have faith. It's gonna get weary, but you can make it. Make it. That's what we do. The fact that we here, that is proof. Walking up right if you have the truth. It's gonna free you from a thought of these recoup. From the wicked, the time's ticking. Don't press towards the things of this world licking. Your top for the things that they have. Realize that's the path that don't equal math. It's gonna lead you to a place that's burning. The whole earth is burning, people yearning. To see the sons of Elohim manifest Overcome it all, man, it's just a test Press Hold on Hold on It's gonna get rough But you can't make it Stay firm Stay firm it's gonna get hard, but you can't make it. You gotta have faith. Have faith. It's gonna get hard, but you can't make it. Be strong. You have to be strong. Thank you. to the Most High and His only begotten Son. We must read Matthew 26, 7 through 13 to get some understanding and show honor to this woman that poured out what everyone else felt was expensive, but she prepared our Messiah for his burial. So with this, we're going to start Matthew 26 and 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Matthew 26 and 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Matthew 26 and 9. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. 
Matthew 26 and 10. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye this woman? For she has wrapped a good work upon me. Matthew 26 and 11. For you have the poor always with you, but you have not always. But me, you have not always. Matthew 26 and 12. For that she have poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Matthew 26 and 13. Very I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman have done be told for a memorial for her. All praises to that sister. All praises to that sister for preparing our Elohim for his burial. All praises. All praises. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.